Okay, good evening. This is the 1020 class. Uh, and this evening we are going to give some introductory observations on the short story and short fiction. Uh, we'll, we'll make some kind of general observations and, uh, you know, uh, our goal here is to, uh, as much as possible, help you to be able to get some sense of what we mean when we talk about short stories or short fiction. Now, let's get this nomenclature out of the way. The distinction between poetry and prose. So when we're talking about short fiction, we're talking about prose. Prose subdivides into two different categories. One category is nonfiction, and the other category is fiction. Okay? Now, nonfiction would be that information which would reportedly be true. All right? Fiction, then, would be that which is untrue. Okay? Then, fiction subdivides as well into two different genre types. One, the short story. We'll talk most about it this evening. The second is obviously the novel. And I'll make some observations briefly at the end of our lecture on uh, Lord of the Flies and the novel itself. Where to start? Let's start with the great German dramaticist named Freetag. And Freetag made an observation through his study of drama that would extend as well into our study of short fiction. And that is, he said about any given story, he identified what he called the plot of the story. Now let's call the plot the map of the story. It's a nice way to think about it. If you think about the story as the topography or the terrain that you have to traverse or travel, the plot is kind of the way that you study that terrain, i.e. it is the map, okay? So, and what he said about this, and maybe from your early years of school you'll remember this, he said that he could think about plot in something of a hill. And so this is often referred to as Freetag's plot hill, where he said ostensibly, in short stories, there are three movements in its most simplistic instantiation, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Okay? And as we look, for example, at not only plays, but also at short stories, and even to some degree novels, although Freetag will make some distinctions about short fiction versus novels that we'll talk about at the end of the lecture, um, you really can kind of define modern types of writing as somehow playing a different type of game with this whole notion. So let's identify, let's outline it real quickly. Well, first of all, you have the introduction, sometimes called the exposition, okay, the beginning of the story, all right? And uh, here, we're, we're really kind of focusing on three things, both as writers of short fiction as well as readers of short fiction. First, we're always thinking about issues of character, okay? You've got to have character or characters, all right? And one of the things that is very important is this use of dialogue. <clears throat> okay. In other words, what we want to do is we don't want our dialogue to be flat. We want our dialogue, when we look at dialogue as writers, we want our dialogue to sound authentic and real. Okay. Uh, and so one of the things we'll pay attention to is the use of dialogue within our stories. Got me? The uh, second thing has to do with place or setting. Sometimes we'll call this setting. In other words, where does the story take place? Some authors will make this Fairly evident. Some authors will make it some kind of unclear. Um, you know, for example, Shirley Jackson's Lottery will play a game, interesting game with place. This story can be read as a story that takes place way in the past, a story that takes place in the current present. It could even be read as a futuristic story, like sometime in the, in the distant future, way, way out there in the future. The other thing has to do with uh, time. Okay, and I was referencing it already as I was talking about the lottery story as well. Uh, the three different places uh, in time where one can set the story, past, uh, present, and of course future, futuristic stories, right? Some authors will elect to leave this notion of time ambiguous. In other words, they want the story to have a sense that it could be read and understood in any time. So it could be past or present or future. Other authors will make a real clear distinction. Early in the story, they will tell you 
what, where we are and what time we are. What's another way, for example, when you read Hawthorne? How can you kind of tell that the story is taking place for us in the past? Obviously, the language or the diction, the way that he tells the story, right? We think as well of short stories by Edgar Allan Poe in the same way, right? You get those, that, that diction that gives it away. All right, after, uh, again, we said this kind of three parts, part one. Part two um, uh, is the, what we call the rising action. Okay. The rising action. And the, the predominant thing here that Freetag really focused on was what we call conflict. Now let's, uh, let's define that as the struggle or the fight of the story. Okay. All stories, Freetag said, and this is a really good kind of thing to try to, you know, critique. All stories have a struggle or a fight of some kind or another. Now we will define this conflict in at least two different ways. One kind of conflict is what we call internal conflict, all right, internal conflict. And here we're talking about character as referenced by a C against, as referenced by VS or versus, the self of the character, okay? This is a character who is struggling with some kind of internal struggle of his or her own making, all right? Should I do this thing? Should I not do this thing? That we call an internal struggle, right? Do we, uh, do, does the character decide to leave with her guy in James Joyce's short story, Eveline, or does she stand there holding on to the little railing, waiting to go on the boat ride, okay? The other kind of conflict is external conflict. And here we subdivide into three categories of external conflict. One, character versus another character. Okay, the most classic example of this is that famous short story called Most Dangerous Game, where you have a character being physically, literally hunted by another character. When you have two characters wailing on each other or whatever, character versus character. Got me? Okay. The second kind of conflict is character versus, often we'll just simply call it nature or the forces of nature. This is the story where the guy alone goes up on the mountain um, uh, on his snow machine, falls, breaks his leg, in comes the blizzard, and now the question is, will he survive or not? Character versus nature. We often think of that famous novella by Hemingway called Old Man and the Sea, where, for example, the old man is fighting against this huge marlin that he, uh, that he finally catches, and then, of course, sharks will attack his prized possession marlin. Uh, character versus nature. Okay? Uh, finally, number three, we can have character versus society <clears throat> or an idea. And this is when a group of characters kind of present a certain kind of force or struggle against the main character of the story. All right? Now, Freetag said, and I think this is really important for you to consider as you are thinking about the, pay, the short stories that you've read, Freetag said, Everything about a story is defined by its conflict. And great short stories can have different conflicts depending upon your focus on the story. Think, for example, of D.H. Lawrence's classic story, Rocking Horse Winter. If I were to ask you, what is the conflict or the struggle in that story? Well, we have multiple answers to that. One answer, of course, is that clearly there is an internal struggle. Young Paul is hearing the house whisper, there must be more money. There must be more money. And that internal struggle for him is the reason why he gets on his little, you know, toy rocking horse and rides to try to figure out the winner at the Malabar, uh, you know, um, contests. But you could make the argument that also that story seems to play the game of some external conflicts as well. For example, it's fairly clear that Paul's mother feels that she now is living in a socioeconomic situation that is not so great. 
She doesn't have the right kind of money. Even though she is clearly upper middle class, still there are socioeconomically speaking people who live a better life than she does. She blames a lot of that on her husband, who she says, really I married kind of a looser, if you will. All right. So notice how the story, and we could play the same game. We could play this game with the lottery. For example, quite literally in the story, there is an example of character versus characters. By the end of the story, we have a stoning that takes place, correct? But you also have other kinds of examples of conflict as well. Here's the deal of free text said about conflict. Conflict ultimately leads to climax. Some people, by the way, will differentiate and will call this, and we'll go ahead and do this now, even though I said three, we'll call this part three of the story. Now, children will often, and immature uh, students will often say that the climax of the story is the most exciting point. This character reaches out for the front door handle, puts his hand on the door handle, gets ready to turn it, when all of a sudden the door handle starts to turn on its own, and the door starts opening without him touching it. The climax of the story. Uh, but this is really sophomoric. It's more important for us to think about the climax as the fruition or the completion of the conflict, okay? That is a much better way to think about climax. In other words, let's point out that depending upon what conflict you focus on in a short story, it is altogether possible that the climax for you will be different depending on what you concentrate on in regards to the conflict of the story. Okay? Finally, number four, we have what is often referred to as the falling action. The French word here is the denouement, which just simply means the tying up, the bringing together. We often will refer to this also as the resolution. Here we're thinking often in some older kinds of short stories, the moral to the story. Okay. And the way to try to bring the story to some conclusion. Now, sometimes, we should point out, it is a hallmark of more modern short stories, and we should say maybe postmodern short stories, that the falling action and the resolution happen often exactly at the same time as the climax. Okay? So for example, famous short story called The Sniper, where two individuals, classic character versus character short story, are shooting at each other from on top of buildings. The one character, using kind of a fool or a trick or a ruse, shoots the other one. He falls and tumbles down into the street below. And all of a sudden, the one who has done the shooting feels obligated to find out who it is that he has shot because this is the time of the Irish Civil War. He crawls out into the street, bullets going all around. He himself is already wounded. And the short story writer tells us he turns the body over and he looks into the face of his brother. And in an old anthology that I taught this story to students in that anthology, turns his and looks into the face of his brother was the last line of the right-hand page. And all the students would collectively report, they would quickly turn to see what the next line was. On the next page, there are the questions. That was the end of the story. There is no moral to the story. There is no comment by the author about how sad it is that civil war often leads brothers to kill each other. None of that is spoken at all, okay? So, resolutions different. I mean, it, you could look now at each one of the short stories that you've been reading, and you could ask the simple question, to what degree does this short story conform to the traditional plot hill? To what degree does the short story depart from the traditional trajectory of the plot hill? Okay. There, however, notice, in all the short stories that you've been reading, and you've read one or two now, obviously, Notice, there is some element of exposition. There's some notion of characterization there in dialogue. There's some notion of place and time, setting and time, right? How authors decide to do that can be very creative. There is some notion of conflict, sometimes internal, sometimes external, sometimes both, depending on how you wish to look at, focus on the story. 
And if you'll think about it, we could, we won't do it now, but we could ask about every one of those short stories, what do you consider to be the primary conflict of the story and the climax of the story? In every one of those stories that you read, you will note that the conflict will lead to the climax, which ultimately is, again, the fruition or the completion of that conflict. And then there's some sense in most of those stories of some kind of falling action or denouement, bringing together, tying up, resolution at the end. For example, a Hawthorne text is going to play the game more clearly of providing the necessary moral to the story. Right. Notice how James Joyce in his short text, Araby, will play a similar kind of old-fashioned resolution game. He looked up into the night and his eyes burned, right, and on and on it goes there for that final line. Giving a sense of a resolution of sorts, but it's kind of, uh, we might say, pessimistic, right? Not very happy. Let's talk now real quickly about other ways that we can think about short fiction. If you'll think about our three levels of reading, Level one is just summary level. If you'll think about it this way, level one is in many ways kind of recording the trajectory of the plot. First this happens, then this happens, then this happens. Another way, more clearly, to kind of do your annotations of short stories is to just conform to this plot hill. Who are the characters? What is the setting? What is the time? What is the identifiable conflict, etc.? And as you read through the story, you can identify stories through this plot hill. It's actually a quite useful uh, kind of uh, schemata, if you will, all right, to help you understand how to read the story. But notice at level 2A, we concentrate often on themes or messages. And we can look at stories as possessing themes or messages. Or, maybe another way to say this is, although the story itself may not possess the necessary theme or message, the reader seems to kind of like to draw certain types of themes or messages out, right? Depending on how you read Eveline, for example, James Joyce's Eveline, you can determine the type of theme that we're playing with. What kind of theme are we playing with, all right? A story of an hour, at no point does Chopin step in and say, this is the theme of the story. Let me explain, uh-uh. You read the story about a woman who is told her husband is killed. First she is sad, that doesn't last long. Then she feels free, right? And then she comes down the stairs to see her husband alive. Surprise! And her heart, which we're told at the beginning of the story is kind of fragile anyway, gives out. And while her husband, ironically, notice the interesting resolution of the story, her husband will believe that she died out of joy for seeing him. Yeah, it's a bit darker than that for the reader, and we realize that she dies of a broken heart. She thought she was free, and then she discovered she wasn't free, and her poor heart couldn't handle it. Okay? So notice that we can play a game of themes, messages, and ask, what is a story like that? What is a theme of a story like that? We can also, of course, play the game of 2B. Here, we're looking specifically, when we look at stories, at different kinds of fictional elements. We add poetic elements, we can have fictional elements, and guess what? Sometimes they're very similar. So, for example, you can play the game of the metaphor as working in a story. Sometimes we'll often refer to this as well as symbolism where a certain kind of attachment is made by the reader, or even sometimes constructed by the author, um, importance given to a certain symbol. For example, notice in the novel Lord of Flies, when it's time to talk for the young boys on the island, newly arrived, they have a conch or a shell. When you're possessing the conch or the shell, you have the right to speak. But notice at a pivotal moment in the story, in the novel, one of the young men decides he's had enough with the rules. He takes the shell, he throws it to the ground, he breaks the shell. All of a sudden, this shell is no longer just a shell for us as readers. It becomes a symbol. A symbol, we might say, of unity or harmony. And of course, it's broken. And it will be from that moment on that a certain kind of disunity or disharmony will begin to play out on the island terrible things will begin to happen. Rocks start falling on people's heads and of course we start deciding to completely destroy the entire island to try and burn Ralph out of hiding 
It doesn't make much sense though, does it? You're going to burn everything that's alive on the island so that you can get Ralph, and the moment that you kill Ralph, what will you eat? Right, see this, this is problematic, the environmental reading, the environmentally destructive reading of the, uh, of the uh, novel. You can also have what we call foreshadowing. We saw this in our discussion of drama. You can also see it, of course, in short fiction, where certain things will happen at the beginning of the story. We go back to the lottery and we reread. Once we know how the story ends, and we ask ourselves, how could I have missed so clearly the levels of foreshadowing that were in play? Not unlike the short poem that we read by Browning, Prophyra's Lover, where if you go back and read that story again about a guy who strangles his girlfriend by wrapping her beautiful blonde hair around her neck and killing her, if you go back and look at the opening lines of that poem, you identify some foreshadowing. Uh-oh, I should have known there were certain kinds of words and phrases being used that let me know something was up. Astute readers of short fiction will often pay close attention to some of this foreshadowing stuff, trying to see what in information is going to be given out in the exposition, which leads to uh, preparations for the climax and the resolution. Finally, let's talk a little bit about the difference between short fiction and novels. Obviously, they both are works of fiction, but they play different kinds of roles. The primary difference between the novel and the short story is that the short story usually seeks to concentrate on one primary conflict and to that degree conforms fairly nicely to Free Tax Plot Hill. The novel, we might argue, is a series of these plot hills where we have a series of kind of plots and subplots that are unfolding. Now that's not to say that you can't look at, for example, a novel like Lord of Flies and overall see a certain kind of plot. Obviously you can, and we do, right? But notice that the plot of Lord of Flies will play a series of these kind of conflictive games back and forth, right? So we'll have many, if you will, plots or many small pl uh, short stories embedded within the overarching novel itself. So for example, the whole story of Simon taking his little walk in the woods discovering that boar's head that's sticking on a post, we in that scene will obviously understand the meaning of the title, Lord of the Flies. And, of course, Simon discovering there's nothing to be afraid of, there's nothing to be afraid of, coming back to tell everyone the good news, running down the beach to provide the good news, the boys themselves are there dancing around the fire. Jack makes the decision Maybe Jack knows that Simon's discovered the truth. Jack wants to keep power, and so they kill young Simon. Now that entire sequence of events could be construed as almost a short story within the novel itself, or a smaller plot within the larger plot, okay? So as you read a novel, you can be paying attention as well at level one to that kind of work, all right? With that in mind, let's make some quick and final observations about Lord of the Flies as we get ready for our final here coming. Lord of the Flies, of course, is a novel that will ask some very demanding questions, Golding intentionally doing this. The story will const be constructed around a hypothetical. What would happen if a group of young men who are trained in military academy find themselves in survival mode there are no adults, which is to say, no authority figures there to tell them what to do. However, they've been raised with discipline, and so right away, notice how well they do show discipline. But, as we mentioned already, there becomes a fissure between who will become leaders, and ostensibly you have kind of a break. Notice these characters in the novel become kind of stereotypic-like characters. Jack often referred to as the Machiavellian character, might makes right. Ralph and, of course, his sidekick Piggy are going to be more the intellectual types of leaders. Let's reason and think things out before we do anything kind of crazy. Notice that immediately there become two groups on the island dependent upon what their focus is. For one, the creating of some kind of fire or flame so that maybe they can get off the island. For the others, why would we want to leave this perfect place where we can hunt all day and uh, have fun on the island? And so Jack and his warriors will begin their slow process towards taking over the island. Dropping a rock on Piggy's head halfway through the novel tells us that this isn't going to end well. 
And ultimately, at the end of the novel, notice, the decision is to smoke Ralph out by literally burning up the entire island on which they live. Note the irony. There's two disturbing ironies at the end of this novel. One, building the fire, quote unquote, works. In other words, what brings their rescuers to the island is the large plume of smoke that's seen when they decide to torch the entire island. But more disturbingly, Golding will give us a very dark observation at the end of the novel. For many of us who read the novel, we are inclined to say the problem on the island and what went wrong is there is not an authority figure. These are young men. They're in their early formative stages, and it's easy to explain how they could kind of lose their way, morally speaking. If only there were adults on the island. Adults would be able to reason things out instead of dropping rocks on each other's heads. And yet, notice Golding. Nothing is missing in this novel for the author. He's not going to give us some fisherman who sees the plume of smoke. Who is it that comes at the end of the novel? It is a military man. What are they doing? Practicing war games in the ocean. What are war games? Well, war games are, of course, when adults decide to practice dropping rocks on other people's heads. Oh, well, no, they're not rocks, are they? In Golding's day, they're atomic weapons, which, of course, Golding himself was deeply concerned about. So in other words, at the end of the novel, while we all go, yay, the boys are rescued, we realize Golding playing a very difficult game with us. Yes, rescued, but rescued by who? Military men. Military men who do what? Resolve conflict by dropping rocks on heads of those they disagree with. And immediately Golding kind of takes us then spinning as readers as we try to figure out the dark picture of Lord of the Flies. Thematically then, such a beautifully constructed novel and yet at the same time such a horrifyingly constructed novel because we recognize there's great uncertainty as we finish the novel about what went wrong on the island. So there you go, introductions to the short story and finally the novel itself. I hope that this information will be enough for you to get ready to write now your final papers. Thank you.